Welcome to our next session. Please come in, come forward. Uh, Morrow isn't that scary. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Morrow from GeoSolutions. Uh, he's got a presentation here on one of the more exciting aspects of GeoServer, using it to crunch data with WPS and SQL views. And I'm going to get out of the way and pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jody. So we are going to talk a little bit about uh, something exciting in GeoServer. So the, the ability to process data in real time as you render your own maps. And we will see which tools GeoServer offers to do these kind of things. I work for a company named GeoSolutions, as my colleague Andrea did at the last two talks. So I'm basically here so that Andrea can rest a little bit, since he's a little bit busy today, with something like 10 presentations. No, just five today, well, just a little bit. So I try, as a colleague, I try to help him to rest a little bit. OK, so the first tool that GeoServer offers to crunch or process your data in real time is one of the, probably the most unknown OGC protocol, the WPS. WPS means Web Processing Services, so it's all about processing your data, either in real time or in batch. So we will try to introduce it a little bit. It's an OGC protocol, and it's a way to standardize one of the most difficult things uh, when we process data, the uh, ability to do any kind of calculation and processing in um, when dealing with our data. Well, it's a little bit different than WMS and WFS or WCS that are very specific protocols that can do very uh, specific things while WPS tries to cover all the rest of the world. So the ability to do any kind of things uh, in, uh, your, with your special data that is not allowed by the other protocols. This is an example of what you can do with WPS. So transforming some sort of uh, geometry uh, doing, doing some sort of geometric operation like buffering. And this is the way you can call WPS with an XML payload. WPS has the ability to be used either synchronously, if you need to do a real-time processing of data, or asynchronously for long-running processes. A common WPS uh, setup is uh, using WPS to interact with uh, some remote service like WFS, WCS, or any other kind of HTTP reachable service to fetch the data you need to process, and then interact through an, a WPS client to do the processing when needed. When we talk about remote in this case, we can extend the meaning to also using the local data. It's either remote or local data, especially when we talk about GeoServer, where WPS is very tightly integrated with the rest of the services. As also Andrea said, uh, other WPS implementation are usually standalone services, while WPS also being an extension of the core, it's not in the core itself, well, I would like to see it in the core in some time in the future. I don't know if it's in the plan, but I think it would stand well there. But also, if it is an extension, it is very tightly integrated with the rest of the system. So, for example, it can be used from other protocols like WMS for doing only the processing part of rendering a map. This is the reason why we talk about WPS when we want to do real-time processing of data in our rendering workflow. In GeoServer, you also have a way to easily create a WPS request, because as you have seen from the buffer example, probably creating an XML for doing a WPS simple request is not so easy at all. So we have a little request builder directly integrated in the GeoServer UI that you can use to generate your request on the fly with a visual interface. And then the real power of uh, WPS uh, when integrated with uh, WMS is the ability to create so-called rendering transformations. 
So uh, it's the ability to transform your data as you do your rendering. And it can be done just writing the, your process description in SLD or other kind of styling languages to uh, process your maps through WMS. But WPS is not the only tool that you can use to do crunching or processing of your data. There are other tools that are quite useful for these kind of things in your server, especially if uh, your data source is a spatial DBMS, not a generic source like shape files or other kind of sources. When you deal with the spatial DMS, that is probably the preferred source in general for vector data in particular, you have another tool that we call the SQL views, and in particular the parametric SQL views. We will look a little bit to them in detail. Parametric in particular are quite powerful because they allow to take some input from the user to make the processing. So the processing can be not only in real time, but also dynamic and depend from what the user is asking and can make your maps very interactive and very dynamic. How does a parametric SQL view work? You basically uh, can use them through the usual WMFs or WFS clients. And you can interact in a more direct way with the underlying database. When you, you configure a layer in your server to be used either by WMS and WFS, uh, you usually only specify the table from the database that you're going to use. While if you uh, want to have a more uh, detailed query of what you can extract from, uh, from the database, with SQL views, you can specify also a SQL query instead of a simple, data, a simple table so that you can interact with your spatial database more tightly. This is an example of uh, a SQL query that you can specify in a SQL view configuration UI. And the ability is to use the real power of the underlying database in your query. So for example, if you use PostGIS, that is probably the most used DBMS with your server, you can also use the uh, PostGIS functions like ST make line. In, in this example, we are just transforming point data into lines, connecting the points in a particular way. Uh, this is a, an example we have in our training where we are using storms data so that we can basically connect all the positions of a particular storm by a line. So we filter the storms by, we filter the point by the storm the hurricane they appertain to, and we create a line that shows the evolution of the storm itself. And you can probably see, because it is a little bit bold, in this query we also have something that uh, is like a variable, the one between the percent signs, and that makes the SQL view parametric, as we said. So these parameters can be specified when we do the final WMS request, so we can change them at real time. In this case, we are just specifying a, a time interval that the user can specify, for example, through a visual time slider or something like that. Some examples of uh, application we built using this uh, capability are these ones. We have a team time slider in this case, very similar to what we uh, talked about. We can also do some weird things, like changing not only the data that comes to the query, but also pieces of the query themselves, like the operator we want to use for some sort of aggregation in this, kind, in this example. This uses a sim uh, different query. Uh, in this case, you can see we also have an OP variable that is not, a, uh, data, is not data, but it's, in this case, the operation that we want to apply to our data. So we can make it parametric uh, in a very complex way. And another thing that Andrea mentioned is that since we are accepting input from uh, the user, we need to validate that input. So we need to specify the 
valid values for the input. If not, we can uh, have SQL injection problems. Another thing that uh, WPS and other tools in your server allow to do is to uh, go over the uh, limitations that we have in the most simple protocols like WFS and WCS. For example, if we want to do uh, a service of clip and ship, we, it's very complicated to do them only using uh, the basic protocols. We need some sort of orchestration to do the complete workflow. And so WPS is very good also as an orchestrator of operation that we do with the basic uh, protocols like WMS and WFS and also WCS. This is something we built uh, using our front end, Mapstore, to uh, download large amounts of data in a asynchronous way. And this is the UI we built for it. Basically, the user is able to um, build the buffer from uh, a given geometry. And the buffer can be calculated using the WPS buffer process. And the user is able to change the radius of the buffer in real time. And the buffer is calculated through a rendering transformation each time and shown on the map directly. Then the uh, download can be run on the given buffer using another WPS process, a custom WPS process for downloading data. And another process uh, can be used to follow the status of the request because downloading uh, a big amount of data can require time, so we need some asynchronous process to be involved. And we can also monitor how that is going. This is a generic dia diagram of how these kind of, of things can work. So we have uh, different uh, WPS processes that are orchestrated by the Mapstore UI in this case to get the final workload. And WPS interacts with the other services and with all the GeoServer Configure catalog to extract the data. Another thing that can be done with WPS is creating dashboards and widgets that aggregate your data instead of showing it in a simple way. Also, this one has been done using Mapstore. We use the aggregation properties processes that WPS includes to do charts. These are some examples. And also the other kind of widgets that aggregate data in some way. There is a very simple wizard-like interface for creating these kind of things. And then you get the final results. If you want to have some, something more complex like a dashboard, this can be done too leveraging WPS processes. OK, another example of uh, rendering transformation. This time, this is working on raster data instead of using vector data. We can use the bands from our raster data to extract meaningful information. Like, for example, we want to identify, in this example, the vegetation status from a multiband image. We can uh, use um, some of the uh, raster algebra that is included in GeoServer and was mentioned by the previous presentations, like the GFOL algebra language, so that we can do calculations on the bands of our raster data. And we can build a style that uses this transformation together with a color map to get something like this. This is a different view of the raster that gives us the status of vegetation in the given area. Another capability of uh, GeoServer WPS is the possibility to also run processes that are not implemented inside GeoServer itself as Java processes, but as external tools. In this case, WPS becomes a real orchestrator of something that is processed in some other place. We call this support the WPS remote. Basically, GeoServer is a sort of a broker that can run and monitor external processes running on other servers. 
and can support uh, different languages for writing the processes uh, like Python, for example, or it can simply run some external scripts, so you can do basically whatever you want on the external process. And we use the XMPP protocol for communication between the nodes of this sort of a clustered uh, executor. S supports all the basic operation of WP WPS, included the dismiss operation and also more cluster-based uh, things like load balancing. And then the results get automatically or magically, as we say, ingested in your server using proper converters. And this diagram shows a little bit how this basically works. Okay, one uh, last example of what you can do with all these tools uh, put together, basically. So we will try to understand if we can use SQL views, parametric SQL views, and WPS all together to accomplish something that is quite complex from an initial analysis. This is a project that was involved. It was basically my first work I did for GeoSolution. I was probably hired to do this. And I did it for a couple of years, at least. So it's a very complex project. The, feature, the main feature of this project was to compute the risk of road accidents that was involving dangerous goods. So chemicals, petrol, gases, and so on. We had a lot of objects to take care of, like the roads themselves. And everything that was around the road that could be involved in case of an accident. So we needed to calculate the damage that we, we could do with a possible accident. The objects that we had to handle were both uh, human or not humans, so that can be the resident population, or there can be hospitals, and stuff like that, also vegetation. We have to use uh, a very big uh, road network to do our calculations, and as uh, we usually do to manage complexity, we try to split the complex pro problem into more simple ones. That was our first uh, idea. So we divided all the road network in different uh, aggregation sizes so that we can handle different kind of uh, information at different levels of aggregation. We also had to calculate uh, areas around the roads that could be affected by the incidents in different ways. So we had to calculate buffers around the roads of different sizes. In particular, we had around 50 different buffers that we had to calculate, and we had different kind of possible targets for our accidents. We were given a quite complex, as you can see, formula that we had to calculate. This is giving us the risk of an accident in a given road segment. We had to calculate this kind of formulas in real time. You can see that this is something that sums uh, another sum, another sum, another sum. It's quite complex if you need to calculate it by hand or also by using a mm, computer. It takes a lot of time if you do it in real time completely. So we had to find some tricks that allow to do this kind of calculation in sort of a real time way. Finally, we also had to render all this data in a map. This was our final purpose. And we basically had to color the road segments depending on the level of risk that we had calculated on that particular road segment. And this was happening at different levels. At the road segment, but as we were going distant from the roads, we were doing area calculation instead of working directly on the network of the roads. So the possibilities were using SQL views. Mm, it was not uh, so efficient because the variants of uh, parameters that we 
would need to enter in the SQL view itself were too many. There were, there were too many combinations. We could uh, decide to use a WPS process, so a pure Java process to do the calculation, that formula that you have seen in real time, starting from the data coming from a database. But it was too much data to be calculated using our CPUs in real time. So we had to transfer some load into the database. We decided to do some pre-calculation that was helping us to make the real-time calculation fast. So we split the work into some pre-calculation done by some WPS processes that were called asynchronously, that can take all the time that, we, that you need. Uh, basically, calculating everything we needed for uh, a region of Italy required uh, three or four days of calculation. So you can imagine that you cannot do these kind of things completely in real time. But thanks to these pre-calculated buffers and pre-calculated things, we could simulate a real-time calculation based on the input given from the user. Because the real challenge of all this is that some of the parameters for the calculation were given by the user in real time through the web application. And so splitting the work between pre-calculating everything that could be using space on disk allowed to do these kind of things. So in real time, we could calculate the color for risk on the road networks, the buffers, and also the involved targets of different types. That was a, an example of uh, a SQL view that you used for these kind of things. And I think that's all. Any question? Hi, my name is Octavian. Um, my question is uh, regarding the SQL views. What's the limitation of uh, unique points that you, I mean, the number, the maximum number that you use for SQL views in order to calculate, uh, you know, statistics or aggregations? So how many million or hundreds of million points you used? Well, in this latest example, we were basically aggregating uh, I think tens of millions of uh, data. So it really depends uh, on the underlying database since when we deal with SQL views, the most difficult job is done by the database itself doing the aggregation. This is yeah. why we use the database to do it because they are usually quite good in doing that. There are, uh, especially using PostGIS, there are quite a lot of optimization if you, we use the database directly instead of doing calculation inside our Java processes. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank That's you. That's the real power of using SQL views, that you can enable the database to do most of the work for you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> then um, just to connect it to this question, um, what's the use case of having risk aggregated real time uh, to a road network because we, we also have done this, but we've done it uh, on aggregated values uh, worldwide and uh, for a lot of data that we had to ingest. So I don't understand the use case. Well, the use case, uh, the data is not in real time in the sense that the, the data of the traffic is coming in real time. What we do in real time is to create a, a thematic map of the network depending on the user inputs. The user could enter uh, sort of uh, 10 or 20 parameters. So what happens if, the scenario is what happens if, if uh, uh, I have uh, this kind of traffic in a certain amount of the day, what is the risk of, of the accident? Yes. And that would be simulation. for uh, car insurance companies who insure cars in order to verify the risk or what? There's uh, no, no goal. In this case, if it was a public project uh, commissioned by the European community. Thank you. One more question, if uh, someone has. Hello. 
there are no more questions, one observation on, uh, on, your, uh, on your question instead. Um, in, in this project, there was a lot of simulation, like what if we consider only petrol transport, for example, or what if we add another hospital in this position, or what if we build a school there, or what if we remove uh, an activity here or there? Uh, what if we wanted to look at only the weekend, or what we want to do only look at the work days? So lots of what ifs that were piloted by the user interface. That, so that's why it was fully interactive. Uh, second notion, uh, if uh, sooner or later you will stumble into a limit of the database uh, com computation capabilities, at that point you have to switch to something that can compute on a grid, and then you can use GeoMesa or GeoWave to offload the computation to a distributed grid and still do it on, in real time with acceptable response times. Um, Mario, Andrea, do you, you have a booth that they can come see you at? Is this microphone actually on? Okay, so uh, thank you for coming uh, to our session on GeoServer. You've got five minutes before lunch. Given the lineups we saw at the coffee break, I encourage everyone to like head to lunch immediately. Uh, if you would like to ask me any questions, you can find me at the GeoCat booth today. And there's also a GeoSolutions booth if you'd like to follow up with these two lovely gentlemen. Thank you very much.